Hey, this is Jonathan Gilliam. I bet you're thinking that I'm going to do a commercial about my best-selling book, Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness and Attack Survival, before I start the show. Well, usually I would say I'm about to start the show, but, well, I'm about to start the show, but I'm going to talk about The Adventures of Team Little Bigs, a parent's book for children. It's my best-selling book that I created along with an amazing illustrator, Daniel Kreiner, and what it's all about is I wrote a book of pictures. I came up with this idea to teach young children between the ages of two and eight and learning disabled children about safety, awareness, and communication at the youngest age possible. Now, the way the book works is that embedded in each picture is about five lessons, and it follows a day in the life of Team Little Bigs, which is Rico, Jesse, Bonnie Sue, and Meow Meow, all named after my dogs and cat. And so what you do is you give the book to the children. It's all pictures with these lessons embedded in them. And then you go to teamlittlebigs.com and you download the lesson plans or you just pull them up. They're right there along with other helpful stuff, some security tips. You can uh, join a mailing list. There's also pictures that you can download and the kids can actually print out on paper and color. The Adventures of Team Little Bigs, a parent's book for children and its accompanying website, teamlittlebigs.com. The parents go there, get the lesson plans. The child gets the book. You go through it with them. There's even an instructional video on the website, along with a COVID-19 awareness video for your children as well. Go get it. Let me know what you think about it. And let's start the show. The truth has arrived. My name is Jonathan Gillum, and this is The Experts. And welcome back to the show. It is, uh, I guess it's February 2nd. I mean, already, man, it seems like 2020 was the longest year in the history of mankind, and January was the long was the shortest month in the history of mankind the the shortest and most the craziest month ever january 2021 now we're in february i i just i cannot wait to see what every day brings i, I tell you something it snowed harder than i think i've just about ever seen it. i mean i've seen some bad snowstorms but it really came down it's still coming down right now in uh in new york i'm out on long island but interestingly enough this is the first time I've ever seen a snowstorm this bad and there were absolutely no plows. There's just no plows. The only thing I can equate this to, okay, because Governor Cuomo just decided again, everybody just stay home, right? But he he goes ahead and takes a car down to Manhattan from Albany, I guess it was. So this is what you're seeing in New York again is another example of how uh, uh, they just want to shut everybody down. They do not want people leaving their homes. They just, I know it's in several different states around this uh, country, but New York is really the worst it, that I've seen as I've traveled all over this country. New York is the worst. They don't want you traveling. And it's so bad. They're, they're so weirded out by this, or, or not weirded out. They're, they're, they're flexing their power so much. They just didn't, they just didn't plow the roads. That's the only thing I can equate this to is that because the governor made this comment, they just didn't plow the roads. So it's been snowing for a day and a half. There's like 20 something inches of snow out there and they just didn't plow the roads. Hmm. Now it is supposed to rain, uh, later today, I believe, but I don't know how much that's going to get rid of. I don't know. I mean, in quite, you know, potentially that could turn into disastrous ice if the temperature doesn't go up enough. So again, listen, I, I know, I, and this is a great place to start in tonight's show. I know that people think when they, they see the stuff that's written about me in the news, like uh, Mediate, uh, no, Media Matters, um, tried to make me look Stupid. I'll play uh, the the interview that uh, that I did, so you can hear exactly on Newsmax what was said. And they try to make me sound like I'm some kind of supporter of 
right wing extremist, whatever that is, actually, it's there's really no true definition because it's not true. There's really not right wing activists in this nation. What you do see is uh, people on the right who really do care about this nation and the Constitution. White supremacists are not uh, conservative. I don't know what they are. They're hate. They're hate filled uh, separationists. No different than than black separationists or anybody else for that matter. Uh, they are not conservative, just like uh, Hitler was not a Christian, right? They always equate his, Hitler with being a, a Christian somehow. The left loves to do that, but uh, the reality is that there's things going on. And I know that people think that this is uh, just a another conservative guy on you know on a podcast because I've hosted for you know Sirius XM Patriot Channel that's a conservative channel on on Sirius or because I hosted for Sean Hannity on the radio or because I used to be on Fox they forget I was on CNN as well, but that but I gotta be honest I gotta tell you this if you're if you're liberal and you're listening to this you need to realize what's happening that just like the fact that these roads aren't cleared and just like the fact that all this stuff that they've done, I don't know if you realize this, but all this, these strict rules and and mandates that they have done in all these liberal states have actually killed more people than, than conservative uh, locations. They have actually destroyed more businesses. They have actually spread the virus more then locations, well, when I say spread the virus more, they've caused more death, right? Because reality is where we see the virus spreading naturally outside, people going and doing things, we don't see the numbers of death. The death numbers are just not there. The virus count is huge or the hospitalizations may be up, but the death rate's not there. The death rate just in the months of March through May in New York city and many other uh, of these liberal ran uh, states around the country is astronomical. I don't know if you've seen this around the country. I hope you have because it's all over the place, but the numbers that were supposed to be reported about the death in these elderly uh, clinics or nursing homes there nothing there's nothing nursing or rehabilitating about these these uh, clinics around the country they're uh, as evil as they get and as far from a medical facility as you could ever get but the uh, the numbers in New York they say are double what was reported and when confronted with this Cuomo's response was who cares that was his response and it's all because of a mandate that he did. He put in effect in March of last year and then and then lifted it in May. And they're estimating, uh, you know, 17,000 people dead that they know of. That doesn't even include the people who actually left uh, and came home and then within a couple of days died because they caught COVID in the elderly clinics. They don't count those deaths as happening in the clinics. It doesn't count not even COVID, but elderly people who have died because they just gave up on life because they haven't been able to see their families for a year. Some of these people are close to a year. So when, when I look at the reality of what's happening and the reality of things like, uh, the ex FBI lawyer who altered the email in Russia in the Russian case, excuse me, in the Russian case got sentenced to probation. Now, I'm going to go over that story in just a second from the New York Times because there's some interesting things in there. And I think out of all the crap that I've read that comes from the New York Times, this one actually is pretty spot on. But the interesting thing is, actually, I'll tell you what. I think out of all the things that I've seen over the years from the New York Times that this article that I'm about to read to you is short, which they don't typically do. They do long articles and it is, um, it's pretty just, it's, it's just reporting what occurred. Uh, and I thought that was actually halfway decent. Now I don't, I don't suggest you go out and subscribe to the New York times, but I don't know, uh, how this got in there in this unusual because the New York times is always skewed. But what's interesting is some of the things that I've seen 
it just in the past month, or actually since the 20th, really, uh, since um, Biden, I forgot his name there for a minute, he's very forgetful, Biden uh, became the president. And one thing that I've seen is that the news is uh, much less inflammatory now. You know, I'm not saying they're reporting the truth, but it's just not, uh, it's not like a, tremendously in your face like it was before maybe it's just because i don't really watch the news to begin with i I watch newsmax and i'm on newsmax quite a bit so i'm kind of you know as far as that goes involved uh with the news and that's what i watch but by and large i don't even watch the news i look at the headlines and that's about it uh you know you know my philosophy on that Uh, the story is always behind the headlines there's another story back there if you look at enough of the news but it's it's as if the that hype that was in the news i don't i don't say it, i don't think it went away I, maybe it's just because people don't care anymore but it just doesn't you can't feel it it's not in the atmosphere anymore it just doesn't feel the same uh because they were it was almost as if a demon was in uh the nation and it eased up a little bit right after because they got what they wanted so it's eased up a little bit in the rhetoric now, I, I mean, who knows, but there's something definitely has changed in the atmosphere uh, to where things things are still occurring, like not plowing for the snowstorm, but the tension's not there that was there before. I, I don't know. Tell me if you feel the same way. You reach me on uh, Twitter, jgilliam underscore seal, and on Facebook, I'm not on Instagram anymore, they deleted my account, uh, at Jonathan T. Gilliam on Facebook. I'm also on YouTube where I do put this uh, podcast up. And most importantly, if you haven't joined ConnectZing, join ConnectZing, ConnectZing.com. And it's similar to Facebook, but better because you can put what you want on there and not have to worry about being censored. Uh, And so I'm a big part of that along with my buddy Drago, and I've talked about that before. Uh, Go check that out. And Drago's wife uh, Rachel, who's an Air Force Academy grad. Of course, Drago was a Navy SEAL who grew up in Poland and spent three years in a Polish gulag, that's a socialist prison, for having a typewriter. And uh, we've all come together, and Drago created this incredible uh, website called ConnectZing, and then we've developed this into something that's it's coming soon. But it, I'll just put it to you this way. It's an ecosystem, right? It's an ecosystem, a social media ecosystem that's coming soon. So... Go check that out. But that's how you find me. Let me know what you think uh, about how I feel about this. If you feel that that, I'm not saying that the tension is gone. I'm not saying the threat against conservatives. That's definitely stepped up a notch. Uh, Joe Biden has definitely been signing executive orders faster than his his son Hunter can light another crack pipe. But there's some that's just been lifted. It feels like it's been lifted since uh, Joe Biden... Uh, came in office and it's not because of anything that president trump was doing wrong it's not anything that that biden is doing right it just feels like the pressure that was being squeezed upon us for some reason has kind of it's just weird it's just kind of changed it's changed and i think to be honest with you I think it's because they don't have anything to worry about. They're going to say and do whatever they want now. They're not uh, bashing Trump, which I think for most conservatives, when they bash Trump, it's as if they're bashing you. Uh, The censorship that occurred from January 6th until uh, just recently, uh, it's still occurring, but where they were just canning people from Twitter and Facebook and stuff, that has seemed to have subsided a little bit. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I actually, let me know what you think it is. Now, I want to go over a couple of the headlines that I've seen, and I'm going to end up with this this uh, story about the uh, the ex FBI lawyer because I think this just fits perfectly. Uh, uh, it just shows exactly what's actually occurring overall with the uh, with the Department of Justice and the FBI. But let's start first off. Um, I just want to go through a couple of uh, of the stories here. And I did a previous podcast about the reality of the Republican establishment and many of the people who, you know, worked for Reagan, for instance, uh, the guy who was Reagan's chief of staff is now head of the New York Post. 
and he's head of the Reagan Foundation. It's very strange. You have uh, Paul Ryan that's on the Reagan Foundation. You have the Murdochs, uh, Rupert Murdoch and his leftist sons. You have all these different people that are clear leftists that are now a part uh, of the board of directors of the, the Reagan Foundation. And I did a whole thing about them and about how, you know, we all know that the people that work for Reagan also work for Bush 41 and Bush 43. And it's funny how, you know, everybody, I don't buy into this stuff either. The media always talks about how Joe Biden is basically Obama 2.0. Well, yeah, that's how the Democrats work. They don't go out and find new people. They just use people they had. But listen, uh, note, note to everybody out there, that's the same thing that the Republican establishment does, okay? So don't think, that, that's, why they, that's why the never Trumpers were born out of the Republican establishment because they hated the fact that he was using people that weren't them. Now, he did a horrible job, I believe, of still using some of those people from the, uh, from the Reagan-Bush era and using other people. Uh, Washington, D.C. socialites that uh, are part of this family tree of evil. He did it. I think Trump did an awful job of appointments. And uh, and it's come back. It came back to bite him because there was nobody there to support him or help him out. But there was an article um, on uh, out of Reuters, which <laughs> we used to think was real news and real reporting, but it's not. It's as fake and leftist as you can get. But it says it's an exclusive to Reuters. Dozens of former Bush officials leave Republican Party calling it a Trump cult. Uh, and, and it says <laughs> dozens of Republicans in former President George W. Bush's administration are leaving the party, dismayed by a failure of many elected Republicans to disown Donald Trump. And after his uh, false claims of election fraud sparked a deadly storming of the, uh, the U.S. Capitol last month. So, this sounds exactly like people from the Lincoln Project who are also uh, as left as they can get. They're just establishment. They're just, uh, they don't care about the country. Uh, like Kellyanne Conway's husband, what a weirdo, that guy. He's about as useless as a fat dog tick. And so what you see in this story is exactly what I was just explaining, is that these people that worked for, the, for George Bush 41, George Bush 43, and all the way back to Reagan are all political wonks that one know nothing about leadership of the country. Yeah. They were in these positions, but the country didn't do any better under them. And two, uh, they are dedicated uh, to the advancement of their agendas, not what's best for the country. That's why when we look back at the, the Reagan era and before of the, uh, Republican and Democrat relationships, how they, everybody's like, it was different back then. You know, they got along and they were friends, but they, they worked things out and they, they you know, compromised. That's because they were all, a lot of them were leftists or they were just politicians and they moved at a different speed. The leftists moved at a slower speed. They got us to where we are now. Their evil grew. Evil, evil doesn't have to go fast. Evil can go very slow. Um, and that's, the, and then the change ultimately will happen very quickly once they get enough people in power, which is kind of where we are now. But this story, um, basically names a bunch of these people and how they, they went on and call calling conservatives, true conservatives, true constitutionalists, uh, a Trump cult. And the reality is the reason that Trump was elected wasn't because of Trump. He was elected because of us, because enough people saw that that guy was saying what we thought and they, and we elected him both times. Second time didn't stick too well as we see. So it goes, there's another story that goes right along with that. And this one, <laughs> this guy drives me crazy. He's been driving me crazy forever. And I can just imagine what a, a total freaking jerk this guy is in real life, uh, representative Adam Kitzinger. I know some people who, uh, donated to his, uh, campaign years ago. And then when it came time for them to run, he did not return the favor. It's just the kind of guy he is. He is a media whore who loves to be on CNN. And I guess now Fox has him on quite a bit. He's on television way too much. 
okay? And that's the first thing that, that kind of sparked me about watching this guy. But he says that uh, that the Republican Party, he's a Republican now, okay? He says that we traffic in lies and that uh, he wants to take our party back, right? And again, he goes right along with the, with the rest of these Republicans and saying that, uh, this is his quote, the biggest danger right now is that we've become a party uh, that dabbles, not just dabbles. We traffic in conspiracy and we traffic in lies. That's uh, Illinois uh, Representative Adam Kitzinger, right? And this guy is the most worthless piece of crap in the Republican Party next to Mitt Romney. He's absolutely worthless. And his the quote that I just read you is so similar to what Nancy Pelosi says, but with just some words changed that it's it's absolutely sickening. But listen, this is what these people do. Remember, I told you this a long time ago. I, you can watch all the documentaries you want about Hitler. And, and in fact, I, there's a reason why they're on Netflix um, because I, sometimes I think it's subconscious to criminals and evil people to put things out there where they can blame other people for stuff when they're there. It resembles them more than anything. And when you, when you look at Hitler, don't just look at him, right? When you watch these documentaries, watch the people around him. Many of those people just jumped on the bandwagon with that guy as quickly as they could, not because they believed in him, but because of the position it offered them and the power that it offered him. Representatives like Kitzinger, that's what they do. Now that the left is in office, they're going to own our government. They own our government. Don't even think that they don't. They own it now. And it, he will jump right on the bandwagon and make it sound as though we are the problem. That's what kind of weirdo this guy is. He doesn't, he doesn't stand there and stand up to the left. He jumps on their bandwagon accusing us of being the bad guy, of being a cult, of being uh, people who uh, traffic lies. So he goes on to say, it's now or never. The choice is ours. I've made mine, and I hope every Republican and every American who shares our values will choose to join me. Let's take our party back. Well, first of all, turd, Ferguson, nobody's joining you, okay? You're an idiot, and I hope somebody primaries you and gets you out of wherever you are. In fact, that should become a major focus is to primary this guy. Uh, let's listen to him here for a second. I think they have a video of him here. Uh, Congressman, thanks so much for joining us today. At, at the top of the show, we, we played a soundbite from you over the weekend um, talking about how you're getting certified letters from friends and family uh, saying that you've been possessed by the devil. I mean, that's got to hurt uh, in, in a personal way. There's also a number of your colleagues, mostly Democrats, saying, and some Republicans, saying that they've been receiving death threats. They feel like their lives are in danger um, from those who vehemently support Donald Trump and think that the election was stolen. Are you getting that same amount of vitriol in that way as well? Before he says anything, I, the weirdest thing about that is, why are people sending him certified letters that are related to him? Does anybody else find that weird? <laughs> Strange. You do, and it's hard to tell, you know, is that oh, man. the majority of people feel that way, don't they? Because, again, you know, if somebody's happy with you or agrees, they're not really seeking out to send those kinds of messages. But all that does to me is it really doubles down the importance of, of the mission of kind of restoring people's faith uh, in the institution of government and, and, and being optimistic about the future of their country because we have peddled for too long in just darkness and division, and it's just created an untenable situation like we've all seen. That made no sense whatsoever. But let's see what he follows it up with. You've said that Republicans are in need of an intervention. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, I mean, look at it. You know, we can uh, we, we just have to look at where the Republican Party has come from. You know, the party that 
freed the slaves, the party that fought for women's suffrage, the party that took down communism and, and had really a clear eyed view of uh, the future of the country and what conservatism could do about giving opportunity to a kid born in the. Sounds like somebody's trying to get out of the closet. He has them locked in, doesn't it? What the heck is that? city same as a kid born in the suburbs the problem is lately all we've been talking about is darkness and division and you know trying to appeal more to the proud boys than to the uh suburban moms and 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 that's a big problem not just because of the health of the party i mean the health of the party in my mind is secondary to the health of the country because the health of the country has suffered we need two solid functional parties to have real debates I can't even hardly listen to any more of this. First of all, whatever he's doing under there, uh, tapping on that, I mean, I don't even want the camera to pan down because I get visions of Jeffrey Tubin in my head with this weirdo. But And who knows? These people are weird. I'm telling you, a lot of these people in politics are strange. That's why they're... they're that's why they're so focused on this power, right? Because it's a drug for them. They're weirdos. He looks like a weirdo. He sounds like a weirdo. He sounds like a leftist. He doesn't sound like a conservative at all he's he, he's jumping every single uh catchphrase and why that the left stream media puts out he is repeating and everything he says whether it's about the proud boys or anything else that he's saying um the, all the hatred and stuff that he's talking about was created by the left it wasn't created by the right if that's not enough to make you uh, want to get rid of this guy, then I can't say anything else. Complete weirdo. All right. Uh, let's see. What are we looking at here? Okay. <laughs> let's just keep, <laughs> I mean, these headlines are incredible. I'm going to skip over. I'm going to save these two for the last. The story of the FBI and this other one that's kind of a surprise here. But AOC, right? First of all, let me just preface this, okay? Sexual assault is nothing to laugh about. Okay, it happens. I mean, throughout history, it's happened too much. Even in a civilized society, it happens a lot. And it's nothing to be joked about. It's also nothing to be used as an excuse. Just like saying that a person has, that a person goes out and says that they have cancer to raise money is just as bad as somebody saying they were sexually assaulted uh, in order to uh, get attention to what they're saying about something else i i and that's what i see in this story it says aoc says she she's a survivor of sexual assault and then in the small this is on foxnews.com in the small uh subtitle it says she was talking about fears during the riot at the capitol this is the most confusingly written story i've ever seen let me see who wrote this edmund de march uh the story barely mentions what she said about being a sexual assault victim. It, I mean, barely mentions it. In fact, it doesn't really specify what she said actually. And, uh, but it does point out that she was speaking to about a hundred thousand viewers on, on Instagram live. That's what it was. Okay. Now I see it. And she was speaking to about a hundred thousand people. And she said that she was getting emotional over uh, calls to move on from the incident that happened on Capitol Hill on January 6th. She said that that is the same tactic employed by abusers. Okay. She, as far as I could tell right now, she hadn't said anything about herself specifically going through something, but she said uh, the New York post said that uh, she opened up on how she took cover in her office and overheard someone say, where is she? Uh, where is she? And then uh, she said that she thought she was going to die and she's never been uh, quieter in her life. Although that turned out to be Capitol police officer and she was still scared. Okay, whatever. Um, I still don't see the connection here as I'm reading through this, unless there's more to the story that they didn't include in the story, but why wouldn't they include that in here? If with that kind of a headline, it goes on to talk about the fences around the Capitol building. It talks about how Republicans have condemned the riot and some accused um, the Democrats of attempting to do their best to use the riot for political gain. Okay. I'm still waiting in this story for her to say that she was sexually assaulted. Then it says that Casio Cortez uh, accused Senator Ted Cruz of trying to get her killed. It's weird. We know about that. And then Chip Roy of Texas 
had something to say about Nancy uh, or that Nancy Pelosi should get AOC to apologize or they'll be forced to find an alternative means to condemn her. And then it says here in the, the last paragraph, Ocasio-Cortez told her followers that she has not told many people about the assault, but the trauma has a way of compounding itself. Nowhere in this story is there anything about her saying, there's no quote of her saying that she was ever assaulted sexually. Again, at the top of the story, the very first paragraph says that she revealed Monday that she is a survivor of sexual assault while she was talking to followers on live on Instagram. But it doesn't say anywhere in this story if it actually happened. I, I don't know. I, I, but anyway, regardless, the, the reason that I, that I even brought this up wasn't because the story was written so crappy. It's because one of the things that you're seeing is that the left will use other issues like white supremacy uh, or any any other type of thing that they can bring up to to get you to listen to them and then they'll throw other things in or they'll equate it to that like her equating what's happening or what happened on January 6th to a sexual assault and this is just a political tactic the story is weird the fact that she would do that and and then equate that to how she felt on January 6th the fact that, that that security is that bad, if it's really that bad, is also strange. Just overall, that, that whole story was strange. I, I wish I had, well, no, I, I don't want to sit through and listen to anything she has to say, but I would like to actually find out exactly what she said. And that story on foxnews.com, which I have to be honest, has some of the worst written stories and worst editing I've ever seen. I mean, they, they miss blatant mistakes, grammatical mistakes. I'm no grammatical genius, but they miss some big ones uh, constantly. Now, I wanted to, I just want to push on real quick because there's another example of how Democrats and overall establishment politicians get things wrong, okay? And how it's not getting any better now. It's not going to get any better now that all this uh, has occurred. In Oregon, and this comes from USA Today, where it's, you know, they're just such incredible journalists over there. Laugh, laugh. Okay, so Oregon law to decriminalize all drugs goes into effect, offering addicts rehab instead of prison. That's the headline. And now this one I'm going to go through a little bit because it's very interesting. For Janine, and I'm going to try to say this last name, Galixon, I believe that's right. This is in Portland, Oregon, right? The, one of the most liberal places in the world. For Janine Gluckson, Gullickson, there you go. For Janine Gullickson, rock bottom came both slowly and all at once. Okay, that makes no sense. A longtime drug and alcohol addict, Gullickson, pushes back on the idea that one terrible day on the street leads to an epiphany and a climb back to normalcy. That's what happens in movies, not in real life. Now, she's talking from the point of view of an addict. She's a longtime addict. Uh, she says she lived at the bottom for years. Um, she's now 52. Uh, but for me and people like me, I laid there and wallowed in it for a long time. Now, this is very interesting, right? There's going to be the climax to this story, and uh, you'll, you'll get where it is. So she goes on to say, and tell her story. Um, her lowest point was in uh, when she turned 30 in 1998. At that time, she had five kids, ages 5 to 11, by four different men. Classy. She came home from work one day as a locksmith. To, she was So she was a... <laughs> I read this story before, but I missed that part. So this lady, who was obviously uh, into drugs already had five kids with four different guys, and she was a locksmith. I can almost guarantee you she probably robbed some things as well. Okay, so so she was a locksmith, and which is another thing. You should always be careful when you lock yourself out of stuff. Try not to do that, but when you do, get a reputable locksmith, okay? Not one who's been with, who has five kids by four different guys. Um, so, uh 
so one day uh, when she came home from work from being a locksmith, uh, she came home to find that her ex-husband had taken, I guess one of the ex-husbands, had taken her two youngest and uh, kid, children and left the state horrified and devastated and convinced that this was the beginning of the end. She triumphed over her tragedy. No, that's actually not what happened. Her life spiraled. Okay. So already this woman is this irresponsible. Okay. That she has all these kids with all these different guys. And one of her exes came and took uh, two of her youngest and left the state. And she's horrified by that. So what does anybody who's irresponsible do? Well, she just goes ahead and dropped off uh, her other son with his dad and left her two daughters with her mom and took up IV meth use. And, you know, that's that's what a responsible person does, right? No, that's what an irresponsible person does. Then she was in prison six years later and contemplating joining uh, an intensive recovery program when, a, and this is her words, a striking, magnetic, gorgeous black woman walked in the room and it held up a mugshot, and uh, I guess it was her mugshot, and started talking about being in the very chairs where we were, Gullickson remembered. There was life on the other side of addiction and prison, the woman said, but you have to fight for it. And she believed her. Well, this is very interesting, okay? I know I say that a lot, but this is really interesting. She says she remembers thinking, I may not be able to do all that, be what she was, but maybe I could do something different than this. That day I felt the door open to change and healing. Here's the interesting part, and I think what the climax of the story is. Uh, Gullickson, now the executive director of the Mental Health and Addiction Association of Oregon, hmm, is determined to give other addicts the same opportunity. That's why she pushed for the passage of Measure 110. What is that you're asking? First of its kind legislation that decriminalizes the possession of all illegal drugs in Oregon including heroin, cocaine, and her favorite, meth, and also oxycodone. Instead of criminal justice-based approach, the state will pivot to a healthcare-based approach. Now, this is the same healthcare industry that changed transgender from a mental health issue to a medical issue, saying that if somebody feels like they're a woman and they're actually genetically a man, that that's actually a medical issue that they were born into the wrong body, right? So it's God's fault, right? It's not a mental issue that they have. That That's the same medical and psychological industry that is going to try to police the massive drug problem that we have in this nation. That by and large, has never been solved by politics, we know that, and is ran by some of the most dangerous criminal elements the world has ever seen in the existence of mankind. More people die every year at the hands of drug cartels than are killed in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And so, <laughs> instead of well, now, so I will say one thing I've been saying for a long time, okay? This is since I was in college, and this is something that that didn't change when I worked in Central South America uh, in counter-drugs and counter-narcotics with when I was a SEAL, and in the FBI when I worked, you know, doing drug arrests and so on and so forth. So I've seen this from all spectrums, okay? And I, I don't think the system that we have works. It doesn't work, right? You either have to be completely authoritarian when it comes to enforcing the laws. Like there's like Singapore, for instance, right? You chew gum out in public um, or you do graffiti like that one kid years ago did on the wall. And he got 12 lashes or something like that uh, with a cane, which means he can't roll over for like two weeks. It's a very, very debilitating to get hit by that cane, right? I'm not saying that I agree with that punishment, but the fact is there's virtually no crime in Singapore and there's definitely no graffiti and no gum out in the public because they don't chew gum out in public. They like to keep their city clean, I guess, and they take it very seriously. But the point is you either have to be to that extreme to get the drugs to almost completely stop, 
at that point people just wouldn't they you know they just wouldn't start they wouldn't even start because they wouldn't want to take uh, after enough people testify about how bad it is to get caned people are just not going to take that chance they're just not and they're definitely going to not going to repeat offend that's for sure or you have to legalize it and control it and none of that is in here in this thing yes they're going to legalize all this stuff but there's going to be no control it's going to be legalized and if you uh break the law which i don't know how you can break the law because they said offending addicts uh get treatment instead of pr uh, prison time and they uh, and those in possession will be fined a hundred dollars a citation that will be dropped if they agree to the health assessment so it, is it legal or is it not legal because that doesn't make any sense either so I, 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 it, I'm, t I'm torn here because I've always thought that if you legalize drugs, it would get rid of the violence pr uh, problem if the state controlled it, right, and made it affordable and and uh, actually made it cleaner. You know, like MDMA, for instance, was over the counter uh, for depression, and people loved the way it made them feel, and so they started using it as a party drug, and and so you know, the, um, the DEA, uh, criminalized it. And then what did it do? It became a dirty drug where it's not just MDMA that's ecstasy. It's actually a drug that's laced quite often with other things and gets people very, very addicted and they die from that as well. Well, you know, that wasn't such a smart idea. I don't believe that, uh, to be honest with you, I don't believe steroids, uh, the way that it has been, uh, um, the way that it's been criminalized uh, is should be it's it's made criminals out of people that you know are just wanting to lift and get big, um, and quite frankly, that could be done under a doctor's uh, supervision. And as we've seen with, there's not bodybuilders just falling dead all over the place. I, I but that's all because of the DEA and the power of the DEA, and so people you know, and also legislators who want to make a name for themselves, and that's how they you know get their pension and so on. That's why they do these things, right? But having worked in the war on drugs from all different angles, none of that stuff works. People still take steroids. Um, they uh, they still do uh, all kinds of drugs, no matter what, because basically the penalties uh, for users are not really there, and the uh, the ability of the government to get rid of the violence problem has never been uh, looked at. And so <clears throat> what do you have? You have something that falls in the middle, uh, of the gray area, Nobody gets punished enough, and uh, there and there's no uh, assistance by the the government to get rid of the crime and to rehabilitate people. I mean, to be honest with you, people need to be want to be rehabilitated anyway, and they're just not going to do that unless you cause them pain or you give them an incentive. It's just not going to happen. Uh, something like crack cocaine or heroin um, or meth is so addictive that people will destroy their lives over it. They will literally destroy their lives over it. I, uh, I remember going through um, certification where we could uh, go in and look at meth labs, for instance. And I remember this one video that we watched and one person saying something that really stood out. It was He was a recovered meth addict, but he said there is no such thing as a recovered meth addict. He said every day he gets up, he thinks about meth every single day. So when you hear people like Busy Phillips, that uh, meth mouth weirdo uh, actress, um, and she says that she's a recovered meth addict, uh, she's not recovered. It's always on her brain. Above everything else, meth is on their brain. So th these drug laws, while some people say, well, it's an attempt, the reality is it's, it's no different than anything else. It's going to fail. It's going to cause massive violence and drug uh trafficking issues for all the surrounding states we've seen it already with marijuana you think that was bad it's going to get way worse and nobody's going to get better if it's available why would an addict who's this addicted to something that makes them feel this good but also destroys them why would they ever seek any type of counseling if it's legal to take it it's not going to happen so I mean, the, the greatest thing they could do is uh, for the government to uh, take over uh, and then produce things that are less addictive 
with less potency and then try to wing people off that way. I don't know. This is a very difficult thing, and it's up for discussion, but I, one thing I know is what they're doing in Oregon it will not work. And one of the reasons is because people who push for it are meth addicts like this weirdo who, who is also uh, a, uh, I guess, a counselor now. I don't know exactly what she is, uh, executive director of Mental Health and Addiction Association. She's probably got something behind her name for something besides uh, locksmith. Sad state of affairs uh, where we're at in this country when it comes to fixing problems. They don't fix problems. They just make that crap worse. Wow. Okay, the last story I want to cover real quick. Let me see how, how long are we into this. 45 minutes in. Okay, let me let me just cover this real quick. Uh, Ex-FBI lawyer who altered email in Russia case is sentenced to probation. All right, everything I've talked about already during this podcast is really about the sad state of affairs of politics and uh, the just the whole mindset of of left and right and the lies that people use to further their political agendas and these idiots like uh, Ketzinger who says he's a Republican or a conservative and he's not. He's just a, another uh, liar up in Washington, D.C. But this really, really does show you the reality of what I call the family tree of Washington, D.C. and the family tree of politics, which is it's not the swamp. Okay, I keep telling you it's not a swamp. It's a tree. And I've said this over and over again. Envision a big giant tree. If you've ever seen one knocked down by the wind, it uproots half the lawn because of the roots that it has. Just rips up the whole yard. And and it's like an an iceberg. An iceberg is another way, but tree is a better uh, symbolism. But an iceberg is, you know, you see the the top of it sticking out of the water, but the bottom may be five to ten times larger than what's sticking out of the water. Same thing with a submarine. You see the little top of the submarine, and the thing is 600 feet long underwater. But a tree is a good way to look at this. So, And you're going to see examples of this family tree. Okay, there's going to be something. As I read through this story, you're going to see something pop out, hopefully. I'll, I'll go ahead and mention it to you when it pops out. But you're going to see that there's something in here that gives the perfect example of the deep state. Okay, And again, this was written by the New York Times but it's actually a really uh, well done article, short to the point, and uh, really just lays it out there. Okay, a judge rebuffed a, a request by prosecutors to impose a prison sentence on Kevin Kleinsmith, who was the FBI lawyer who admitted doctoring an email used to help authorize a wiretap on a former Trump campaign aide. It goes on to say, let me pull this back up here. It goes on to say. A former FBI lawyer who has admitted doctoring an email during preparation to seek renewed court permission to wiretap a former Trump campaign aide during the Russian investigation was sentenced on Friday to one year of probation and 400 hours of community service, but no prison time. Now here's here's the first part of this that I want you to, to realize, especially all the Q people out there, okay? Stop with the Q. It's not real. Prosecutors led by John Durham, the special counsel scrutinizing the government's actions in the Russia investigation, he was the one handling this, had asked the judge overseeing the high-profile case against the uh, former FBI lawyer, Kevin Klinsmith, to impose, how much was it there, old savior John Durham, to impose several months of prison time, something that would get... Uh, you, you know, an FBI, a regular FBI agent put in jail for years, years, especially if it was connected to trying to overthrow an election and a duly elected president, which they don't, they don't mention anywhere ever. But the judge, James E. Uh, Bodesberg of the Federal District Court of the District of Columbia, said the destruction of Mr. Kleinsmith's career and being vilified in a media hurricane had already provided significant punishment and sent a deterrent message. Okay, let's just stop right there for a minute. That's what this weirdo judge said, okay? If that was the case, then the, then the Democrats have no standing to try to bring anything against the president, and no court in the United States has any standing in trying to 
when somebody does something wrong, if they've been vilified in the media and if their career has been ruined, well, heck, we just let them go from now on. There's no reason to do anything. You combine this mindset with what's happening out in Oregon, for instance, that's also ran by the Democrats. There, there would be no reason to ever put anybody in jail ever again, which would mean that crime and violence would go completely out of control because it would be chaos. It'd be like Lord of the Flies if you've ever read that book. All right. He goes on to say this weirdo judge, anybody who has watched what Mr. Kleinsmith has suffered is not someone who will readily act in that fashion. Hmm. I don't really even, I, I have to read this guy, this attorney's name. I, I don't watch him. He did something wrong. He got charged with it. He should pay. But he goes, the judge goes on to say, weighing all these factors together, both in terms of the damages he caused and what he has suffered and the positives in his own life, I believe a probationary sentence is appropriate here and I will therefore impose it. Now, the surveillance, this story goes on to say, the surveillance of former aide Carter Page in 2016 and 17 was a minor part of the overall Russian investigation but it has become a political flashpoint because of the Justice Department's Inspector General who uncovered numerous errors and omissions in its court in its four court applications, flaws that President Donald J. Trump and his allies used as fodder in portraying the Russia inquiry as a plot by the so-called deep state. Okay, here's the part where I don't agree with this story, all right, is that they have to add stuff like that in there for their liberal base because up until this paragraph what they're doing is just laying out what actually happened but let me just look at this paragraph now maybe i shouldn't have said earlier that it was absolutely good reporting because it's not because this is crap but overall when i read the story i kind of got a good uh, feel for what this guy actually did and for how bad this judge is but let's look at this paragraph the surveillance of the former aide carter page and that was the person, that, the guy that worked for uh, Trump, who I've always said all along, I thought that Carter Page was a plant. And I wouldn't doubt, because this didn't ruin Carter Page's life, I wouldn't doubt if Carter Page and this attorney both knew that Carter Page was going to be set up and be a part of this. That That's my take on this. I've never trusted the guy. He was a CIA uh, informant and or source, and that does not lead me to believe that Carter Page doesn't understand counterintelligence operations. I don't know who brought him in on Trump's campaign and who, who brought him in to work with Trump, but it was, it was a mistake. And I don't believe Carter page is innocent. Uh, so anyway, it says that the surveillance, uh, of the former aide Carter page in 2016 and 17 was a minor part. Well, there was nothing minor about it. Okay. It, they were doing surveillance on Carter page and president Trump, and the rest of his uh, people that were working for him at, at, during the campaign, based on, and actually after he became president, based on lies, based on fake evidence, this dossier that was used to leak information to the media, uh, fake information, the media reported on it, and then they took that information and got the first FISA. There's nothing minor about this at all. The entire Russia investigation was a lie. The story in that paragraph, it says, but it has become a political flashpoint. Yeah, it's become a political flashpoint because that surveillance was based on a lie that the FBI and Democrats and never Trumpers in the Republican Party created and had made and then used it basically uh, to entrap the president. And General Flynn, who I don't, I'm no fan of him either. Um, and they say that these are flaws. There was numerous flaws, right? They say that the flaws, uh, that the, pre that the president and his allies use as fodder in portraying the Russian inquiry as a plot by the so-called deep state. It is, there's no doubt about that. It's a perfect example of the deep state. All right. Set that paragraph to the side. Uh, Mr. Kleinsmith's misdeed was the most e egregious of the problems uncovered by the inspector general in June, 2017, as the FBI was preparing to seek the final renewal. And, and by the way, it, that wasn't the most uh, egregious 
problem. There were many different problems, okay? But in June 2017, as the FBI was preparing to seek the final renewal of the order, an FBI official who was going to sign a sworn uh, description of the facts asked Mr. Kleinsmith to seek clarity from the CIA about whether Mr. Page was a source for the agency, as he had claimed. In fact, Mr. Page had spoken to the CIA in the past about his in, in interactions with Russian intelligent agents. A matter of fact that all four wiretap applications admitted, they omitted this, that Carter Page had already told the CIA that he had had these interactions. That's why they used him. And that might have made him look less suspicious had the court been told about it. But Mr. Kleinsmith inserted the words, quote, and not a source, end quote, into the CIA email and showed it to his colleagues, a colleague who satisfied, which satisfied him and prevented the problem from coming to light internally. So in other words, this unholy lawyer that worked for the FBI went in and inserted the words and not a source as though the CIA had said he was not a source, that Carter Page was not a source. And so when you look at it, when you look at, at what he had said about his interactions with Russian intelligence agents, then it, it makes him without the fact that he was saying that, that it was known that he worked for the CIA, then it makes him look like he's up to something. And so they, they allowed the, uh, the furtherance of this or the re up of this FISA, which is a, uh, a, a wiretap, um, on the, uh, the Trump campaign and his, uh, after he became president. Now the inspector general referred Mr. Kleinsmith for a criminal investigation. And the matter was assigned to Mr. Durham who is a bar plant. Okay. There's bill Barr and there's Durham. Remember all these people, they're all part of the deep state or the family tree. And as I've said before, they may not be leftist, but they're, they are careerist, all of them, and they're not going to crucify each other. Okay. So you can't trust Durham just like you couldn't trust Barr. Uh, let me skip down here. It just talks about Barr and, uh, and him and, and uh, Durham. Um, the Klein Smith case is the only criminal prosecution Mr. Durham's team brought. You see, that's the only case that they brought. There was no secret plan, by the way. There was no like Barr and Durham and the president. There was nothing being worked out. Okay. Out of all the things that they did, all the lies, the entrapment, all these things, that is the only criminal prosecution, and the guy got probation. When Mr. Kleinsmith pleaded guilty last year to making a false statement, he acknowledged that he had intentionally altered the email and created a false record. But he also claimed that he did it not intentionally misleading or to, to intentionally mislead his colleague because at the time he believed the words he inserted were accurate. This is what he tells the court. He had separately told his colleague by text that Mr. Page was not a CIA source, but rather a subsource of someone else who had talked to the agency. Okay. I don't know if that's true, but he's still a source. It doesn't matter. And that's not true because we know that's not true because he actually was, uh, was handled by the CIA. We know that. In arguing for prison time on Friday, prosecutors suggested that Mr. Kleinsmith's explanation made no sense and that he must also have known he was misleading his colleagues. Pointing to evidence that he wanted to avoid the FBI having to explain to the court why it had admitted that fact of Mr. Page's help to the CIA from all the applications. See, they, they just admitted that omitted it from all of the applications that the CIA or that they were using to, that the FBI was using to get, uh, these FISAs, these wiretaps. Uh, but judge Bozberg Bozberg said that based on, on the record, he believed Mr. Klein Smith's version. So this judge, right. Instead of, instead of looking at the whole the whole uh, totality of the of the evidence, he just took Mr. Kleinsmith's version, thinking that it was a mistake, that he had made a mistake, and that, well, the, at least that's what he's making it sound like, that the judge himself thought that Mr. Kleinsmith had just made a mistake, right? It was an egregious mistake, 
that Mr. Kleinsmith thought that Carter Page was a subsource, which is still a source, and that so that that's why he added that in there. Now, here's the thing. All right, as my instructors used to do when in officer candidate school or in buds or just in the military in general, when they wanted you to know that something was going to be on the test and they would stomp their foot on the ground. Right. So just imagine me going boom, boom, boom. That's my foot on the ground. When I said that there was going to be the perfect example of the deep state. All right. The deep state. Listen to this. I wish I had a drum roll. Judge Bozberg is also the chief judge of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, that's the FISA court, which handled the disputed wiretaps of Mr. Page. Although he did not personally sign off on any of them, he was still head over it. After disclosure, Judge Bozberg offered the FBI to review all wiretaps uh, Mr. Kleinsmith had been involved with and the Bureau adopted more stringent rules for its national security wiretap application. Now, let me just tell you, folks, it doesn't matter what uh, rules they have. As we can, as we see, you can break those rules, and there's if you're in the right political frame of mind with the right people, there's going to be little to no punishment. And... This judge who says that he believes, see, this is where this stuff starts to unfold in my brain, and I see this picture, okay? This judge who was head over the FISA court, when the fake dossier came in, when all the applications that were written uh, based on that fake dossier and information that was leaked from that fake dossier to the media, who was the echo chamber for the Democrat Party and leftists, reported this stuff they used that as evidence in the fisa applications along with the fake dossier to get these uh surveillances over trump and the people who work for him and they did that while judge bozberg was head of the fisa court he then says that he believes that mr klein smith made the mistake So he's just going to give him probation and he feels sorry for him because his life was ruined. His career was ruined. Well, his life's not ruined. You know, yeah, he didn't get a $150,000 paycheck on record. I can almost guarantee you somebody's paying for him. He, he, he probably is going to make out just fine. His wife is, is pregnant now with a child. He's almost assuredly going to write a book and is going to be, on some, mark my word on this, he's going to be on one of the leftist media stations before long. Absolutely going to be. I haven't heard any talk of him being disbarred. So if he's not disbarred, that means in the future he can still practice law. I'm not going to go on and read the rest of this stuff, but um, it's, it's interesting. The rest of it, uh, as I read through it, isn't inflammatory like that one paragraph was that dove into the leftist uh, mindset there for a minute. But it, it goes on and on to lay out just more of the same nonsense. And I and I advise you to go look at this if you can. Um, it's If you go to, to the Drudge Report, it's on there right now. But if you look up ex-FBI lawyer, who altered email in Russia case is sentenced to probation. And that's under the New York times. You'll be able to read the full article. And there's, there's not much left in there except for it talks about how, you know, he uh, had to apologize. He wanted to apologize to several different people. And the judge went on and made it some other suggestions about the intelligence court. But this is a perfect example, perfect example uh, of what's going on now the one other thing i wanted to mention about this i was l- reading through this while i'm saying that i'm trying to do two things at once is also what i keep saying about carter page so carter page did not and this is in the story did not ask judge bodesberg to impose prison time for mr Kleinsmith. so carter page has been on in media more than almost anybody that i've seen talking about how he's affected and how bad the left is and all these things that they've done. But then he doesn't ask for jail time for this guy. I find that strange. 
I also find it strange that he volunteered to serve as a friend of the court in future surveillance court matters, citing his own civil liberties experiences as a target of surveillance since deemed improper. So that is still to be figured out whether or not Carter page is an operative. The more I see of this, the more that I believe that he is, I think it's just very odd. You know, as I've said many times on this podcast and on this episode, that what exists in Washington, DC isn't a swamp. It's not really even a, a deep state. What it is, is a family tree. And what we misconstrue as a deep state is actually the root system of that family, that evil family tree. Now, that family tree is made up of leftists and it's made up of careerists. The careerists may be left or they may not be left, but they are definitely all about their career. And what is the biggest national security of this nation, which I've been saying for years, is the family tree that exists in Washington, D.C. That's the truth. I'm Jonathan Gillum. This is The Experts. The truth has arrived. Peace and I'm out of here.